So we even have a strategy that some marketers like to call identity marketing, where uh, they basically pay consumers to become walking billboards for their companies. So just a few of my favorite examples. Reebok, uh, got a bunch of these temporary tattoos. I hope they were temporary anyway. And you know, uh, put, put, had students put the logo on their forehead and, and walk around during the, the Boston Marathon. Um, Another example of tattooing as a form of identity marketing, last year Air New Zealand did a nice promotion. All you had to do was agree to shave your head and then to wear a, an advertisement for Air New Zealand on your, on your cranium. And uh, in return, you got a round trip ticket from LA to New Zealand, which I guess is a pretty good deal. Uh, in the UK, a similar kind of promotion where they paid women to uh, get this little tattoo put on their eyelid. And so every time they wink at someone, it, it's basically uh, you know, flashing a message for the brand. So these are all examples where that fusion between the self and the brand becomes literal. Um, this tattooing is really out of control. Now, I, you know, I teach undergrads. Uh, I don't know about here in Akron, but you know, most of my students look like they're walking around. You know, they just come out of the circus somewhere. Um, that's a whole other story, but, but one of the things that, that you notice is when you look at what people are having pierced into their skin in a very painful way, I understand. Uh, I haven't had one yet, I'm, I'm still tempted, but one of these days. Um, you know, what they're doing is you, you see that, that a number of people, not everyone, but a number of people are having brand logos tattooed onto them. So they're taking this hot ink, this painful process, and they are literally becoming a walking billboard for, for the brand. And you know, when you think about defining brand loyalty, uh, I don't think that there's much more of an attachment than you can get than to have you know, a Wendy's logo tattooed on your arm or, or something like that. So you know, hopefully we don't get to the point where we, we have this kind of thing, although we have had incidents, uh, events where, for example, on eBay, parents have auctioned off the names of their babies to corporations. Uh, perhaps you've read about that. Uh, other people have auctioned their weddings off uh, so that they're sponsored by such and such a company and so on. Um, of course, sports identification, the degree to, to which we identify with brands like that, is the bedrock for, uh, for a lot of things. Uh, fundraising at universities and you know, various rivalries and so on. Did I get this right? Is this a big rivalry? Yeah, OK. Um, <clears throat> at St. Joseph's, uh, we haven't had a football team since 1938, so uh, the students have a t-shirt that says, you know, St. Joe's football undefeated since 1938. So. <laughs> uh, but prior to teaching at St. Joe's, I spent 11 years at Auburn University, and we did have a football team there, so I got, got a chance to see some of the, the level of attachment that goes on there. So as we, as we take these two things together, we take the, this, this movement between the online and the offline, and we take this movement between the self and brand imagery in terms of, of expressing identity, we put those together, I think what we're witnessing is a very interesting phenomenon. And we can kind of think of this as Alice in Wonderland, where we're looking through the looking glass, but of course the looking glass is our computer screen or our iPhone screen, and we are really starting to explore what's going on on the other side of that looking glass. And, and we see this, this theme sometimes in, in advertising where it's not clear you know, which is the reality and which is the reflection or the animation and so on. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a soccer game. And you think, well, this is just an example of really uh, somebody did a nice promotion here where, you know, obviously every time the players go over midfield, there's nice brand exposure for ruffles, you know, so that's great. Now, what's interesting about it, some of you may have guessed, is that uh, if you were, this is a TV image, if you were in the stadium watching this game, this, this logo would not be there because it's superimposed on the TV screen. So this is an example of what I call reality engineering, where marketers literally have the ability to to change the experience so that the people sitting in the stands literally are not seeing the same game as people see, sitting uh, in a television, you know, in the warmth of their uh, living room somewhere. So as we start to see images, uh, you know, basically don't believe everything you see, and I, I think there's, uh, you know, that's pretty, 
plausible to, to say that we can't believe almost anything we see these days. So we, do, we don't really know what is reality or whether, whether it really matters anymore. So uh, we, you know, we see things like this where now, uh, again, you can, if you're willing to kind of give up the exterior of your house, in this case, you can, uh, you can become an advertisement and presumably getting your mortgage subsidized in, in return. So what does that mean for branding and branding strategies? This is a, this is a very classic way to look at, at brands and consumers. Many of you are familiar with this in one way or, or the other. Uh, basically, we usually see some kind of a pyramid in, that, that talks about what we refer to as brand equity. And of course, when we say brand equity, we basically mean the amount of value that that brand has to the consumer over and above the generic version of that, of that product. So to the extent that people are willing to pay a premium for your version of that computer or that sweater, your brand has equity, right? Now, how do we build brand equity? Well, we start at the very bottom of the pyramid where we, our market is broad but shallow. So we talk about brand salience or brand awareness. People have to be aware that your brand exists before they can become passionate about your brand. But just because they're aware it exists doesn't mean they will ever be passionate about your brand. So I, 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 I'm guessing that one of the interesting things about the, the neuromarketing stuff that you're going to be hearing about today is that hopefully over time, or perhaps now, these researchers can differentiate where we are in this brand equity pyramid. In other words, Am I just at the level of brand awareness? Am I further up the pyramid toward uh, what we think of as brand performance? That is, how do I think about the brand? Is it, you know, is it for athletes? Is it, is it for sophisticated women and so on? Am I further up that pyramid? Now, notice the pyramid, by definition, uh, we're, we're losing customers, okay? So, so uh, there's lots of customers that are aware of the product, but as we progress up the pyramid, obviously, we're gonna be losing customers but the customers we retain are gonna feel more and more involved with that brand. So we like those people, because they're not just aware of who we are, they're really thinking about who we are. So we get to this level where, we, where they start to form judgments. Not only is the brand for athletes, but I think that's good. You know, I wanna be one of them, I wanna be like Mike, Michael Jordan. You know? I, wanna, I wanna feel good, and I think this brand will make me feel good. Then we reach the apex of the pyramid, and most brands never reach this what we think of as brand resonance. Now, when we reach this, this is the holy grail for marketers. We're talking about true engagement. And here is where I think those people who have elected to tattoo those brands on their bodies are at. They're not just feeling good about Wendy's, they are feeling a part of Wendy's, and Wendy's is a part of them. So that's really the place where we want to take our consumers, and maybe that's where Steve Jobs took Apple. So as we, as we think about this tremendous attachment and the, and the business value of that, we have to change the way we look at brands and how we measure the value of brands, which many of you are probably engaged in on an almost daily basis, measuring in, in some way the, the, the value of your brand. So first of all, as things are changing, we have to think, we, in the old days, you know, two years ago, brands are assets controlled by the firm, and today, I would argue that brands are co-created entities. That is, you as the producer of the brand do not own your brand outright. You own it along with the consumer who brings his or her own meanings to the brand and you work together to refine the meaning of that brand. Brands exist only in the minds of consumers. No, today we understand that brands live in cultures so that there are shared meanings that circulate among members of cultures or subcultures or ethnic groups that bring that brand together. And one way that we know that we belong to a group is that we use things in common with other people you know, who are using the, the same thing. So it's, you know, if you ever had the experience, you pull up next to a stoplight and someone pulls up next to you, they're driving the exact same car you are. And you're really curious to see who, you know, is that a cool person driving that car? Or, you know, because they've obviously got the same taste, in, at least in cars, that I do. Finally, a focus on what brands mean to a focus on how brands come to mean. That is, what is the cultural process over time by which brands move up that pyramid of brand equity to the point, if they're so lucky, that they become 
that firmly embedded in people's minds and knowledge structures that they are willing to go out and get those logos tattooed on their foreheads or backsides or wherever they choose to do that. 